Good afternoon, everybody. So, good afternoon to all of you gathered here in Mi'kma'ki on unceded Mi'kmaq land at King's and in Alumni Hall, and uh, also to those who are with us via live stream. I thank each of you for joining us. If you don't already know me, I am President Bill Leahy. And I'm here to talk about the final report of the independent review on accusations of sexual assault against, against Dr. Wayne Hankey, which, as of 11.30 this morning, was uploaded to the homepage of the King's website. Perhaps some may have already had an opportunity to review it. I will return to the report shortly, but I want to begin by acknowledging that it and our discussion today covers sensitive subject matter, including references to sexual assault. And I want all constituencies of our college community to know there are sports, supports in place for you today and into the future, both on campus and online. Students in particular, the senior common room is yours today until 3.30. And there you will find active listeners, there will be snacks, and there will be other resources. Alumni, King's is providing counselors with whom you can book online appointments. Faculty and staff, counselors with LifeWorks are on site today and tomorrow. For alumni, faculty, staff, and students, information on how to book appointments, as well as a comprehensive list of the whole range of available supports is on the grid of the homepage of the King's website under the heading Final Report, Community Supports. Sexual Health and Safety Officer Jordan Roberts and Dean of Students Katie Merwin have organized these supports. And both Katie and Jordan are here in Alumni Hall, as is Dr. Sarah Clift, King's Vice President. The three of them have led the community's work on King's Action Plan for a Culture of Consent and Respect, which forms the response to recommendations of the Independent Review's interim report, which we received in May. To provide context, and perhaps particularly for students in the second and third year who weren't here when all this started, I'll briefly review the events that bring us together today. On February 1, 2021, retired Carnegie professor Dr. Wayne Hankey was charged by Halifax police with one count of sexual assault, arising from an incident in a King's residence in 1988. The following day, King's announced the independent review. On March 4 of 2021, we confirmed the, the selection of Janice Rubin and her colleague Elizabeth Bingham at Rubin Tomlinson LPP to conduct the independent review. Their terms of reference were shared that day with the King's community. The independent review had dual purpose, which Ms. Rubin decided to address in two separate reports. One part of the mandate was to make recommendations on the steps Kings must take now and in the future to ensure it provides a safe environment for all members of its community in accordance with the commitments Kings made in its sexualized violence awareness, promotion, and response policy, which was adopted in 2018. This part of the mandate was addressed in the interim report. 
The second part of Ms. Rubin's mandate was to determine the facts and an appropriate response to the historic incidents that led to the, at that time, one charge against Wayne Hankey. The final report we released today addresses this part of the mandate. The division of the review in this way allowed it to be conducted alongside the criminal process that was underway when it was created. In April of 2021, two additional charges, one of sexual assault and one of indecent assault and gross indecency, were laid against Wayne Hankey. Dr. Hankey pled not guilty to all charges. A year later, on February 5, 2022, two weeks before the first trial was set to begin, Dr. Hankey died. The next day, I wrote to the community to confirm King's intent to continue the Rubin Review, which was always separate from any criminal justice process. King's received the interim report in May of 2022 and shared it with the community on May 31. The university accepted the report and all its recommendations. To do this, King's developed its action plan for a culture of consent and respect. The plan was shared with the community in September of 2022. As a living document, updates to it were posted in January. The plan will continue to evolve. In a true culture of consent and respect, this work will never be fully complete. The interim report and the action plan are both available on the homepage of the King's website. As we move forward, updates will be provided not only by emails but by gatherings to ensure the whole King's community is aware of our progress and has opportunity to ask questions, to critique, and to make suggestions to the plan's ongoing development and improvement. These will be in addition to the many meetings, workshops, training sessions, and events that have happened on campus since September, with a focus on putting the recommendations of the interim report into effect as quickly as possible for those who are now living, studying, or working at King's, or who visit us at King's. I want to take a moment to acknowledge Janice Rubin and her colleague, Elizabeth Bingham. Our confidence in Rubin Tomlinson, a leading firm in Canada for this work, was well placed. I thank them for their integrity, sensitivity, and hard-nosed focus on the truth they brought to their work. Their stewardship of this difficult and arm's length process has been exemplary. One of the men interviewed by Ms. Rubin described the experience to me as cathartic. And to use his words exactly, he said he found strength in being part of the solution to this horrific experience. Anticipating the, the arrival of the final report on January 31, I sent a message to our community that my receipt of the report would initiate a process of meeting with or speaking to and listening to all the subjects of the report who wish to speak with me before the release of the report. I have thanked each of these men I have spoken to for participating in the review, and I have apologized on behalf of the university to each one of them. I add here that after receiving my apology, one of the men asked me to share that he is now hopeful that this final report marks the beginning of true healing for him and for the others harmed. Before going on, I want to pause here to express my sincere gratitude to all the men who are described in the report as subjects for coming forward. Whether I recently had the chance to visit or speak with you or not, 
I acknowledge with deep admiration the courage and resolve required by each of you to overlook your personal discomfort and pain to be willing and able to come forward with your experiences and to hold the university accountable. You have our respect. To those with whom I did meet or speak, I thank you for your grace and for the help you have provided me as I prepared what I would say to our whole community today. The pattern of abuse, of abuse laid bare in this final report informs today's remarks. To be very clear, I am not saying there's anything good about this pattern, but I would like to say it was helpful for me to be with you and to be permitted to witness from your respective the relief that some of you showed through the recognition and affirmation that you were not alone. We accept the conclusion of Ms. Rubin that there are likely other experiences within her mandate yet to be shared. Accordingly, in accordance with Ms. Rubin's first recommendation, I am announcing that anyone who has not yet come forward to Ms. Rubin because of any number of fears or concerns that they will have the next 30 days until April 14 to do so in complete confidentiality. Later today, we will be sending an email to all alumni with Ms. Rubin's contact information to ensure all of our alumni are aware of this extension in the work of Ms. Rubin. We will also post her contact information on our website. If warranted, Ms. Rubin and her colleagues have committed to amending the final report if they learn new information that, in their opinion, should be added to it. With these things said, I now directly address the final report. I am not going to detail the extensive investigative process that went into its creation or enumerate the findings it reaches for 13 distinct incidents, one of which involves repeated sexual assaults over multiple years. The report and all its findings are available online. If you have not already done so, I encourage you to go to the website and read it in full. You will see the report does not use names and it carries redactions where necessary to protect the privacy and confidentiality of those who came forward to contribute to the review. For our purpose today, I will focus on the report's main conclusions. They read as follows, and I quote, and uh, in preparation, it is a lengthy quote. Based on the evidence available to us in this process, we have concluded that Dr. Hanke engaged in a pattern of predatory and abusive behavior towards some young men. We became aware of numerous incidents which ranged from subtle solicitation, sexual suggestion, homophobic remarks, to sexual assault. In some instances, the reported behavior fell outside the student-teacher relationship. We have chosen to consider it here because taken together, it establishes a pattern on the part of Dr. Hankey. The behavior was unwanted by these men. They did not consent to it, and it caused them stress at different levels of intensity. Most of Dr. Hankey's conduct described below, and again, I'm quoting from the report, was connected to Dr. Hankey's employment and role at King's. Indeed, based on what the interviewees told us, 
Dr. Hanke was able to exploit his position to do this. He had access to young men through his teaching and social life at King's, as well as his position as a Don in King's residence. For that, we believe that King's is responsible for its role in the harm Dr. Hanke has caused. Given Dr. Hanke's position within the university at the time, the fact he was an Anglican priest, and the power differential between Dr. Hanke and the men he took advantage of, it is not surprising that no one complained against him. Indeed, had they wished to, there would have been no obvious mechanism at the university to do so. In our view, King's response to becoming aware of Dr. Hankey's inappropriate behavior or suggestions of it was lacking. This served to protect Dr. Hankey. We, are, we wish to be clear that this is our conclusion even when the university's behavior is judged by the standards of 30 or 40 years ago. These are sad and sobering words to read. They reach into us to feelings of remorse. They demand response and apology. On behalf of the University of King's College, I unreservedly and unequivocally accept Janice Rubin's findings and her five recommendations. This includes her recommendation that King's has a responsibility for what happened to those who have come forward. We must accept accountability by making amends to those who have been harmed, including by providing appropriate and just compensation as called for in Ms. Rubin's second recommendation. Dr. Hankey caused harm to young men who put their trust and confidence in Kings. As described in this report, when a formal complaint about his behavior came to the university in 1990-91, the university's probes were serious. That's Janice Rubin's characterization, but inadequate. We failed to connect dots that could have identified Dr. Hankey with a pattern of behavior including by failing to consider the parallels between some of the facts of that complaint and a 1981 incident when Dr. Hankey was found in the King's swimming pool, pool with a child. Our response to the 1991 complaint compared to the contemporaneous work of the diocesan, diocesan court of the Anglican Church on the same complaint was wanting by the standards of the time as indicated by the different process and conclusions of that court. It is important to stress this key point. The diocesan court found on the same complaint that Dr. Hankey had committed sexual assault and that his wrongdoing was not, as the King's Committee accepted, a matter of having an improper consensual relationship with a student. To the men who have been harmed by Dr. Hankey's reprehensible behavior and the universities in action to spare you from it, I apologize to you deeply, sincerely, and publicly. We apologize for what was done to you and for the university's past failure to address Dr. Hankey's behavior properly and fully. Making this apology to you is the third recommendation of the report, but we do it not because it was recommended we do it because it is the right thing to do. We fail to protect you. We fail to believe you. And we are sorry. 
on the page 43 of the final report, after detailing Dr. Henke's misogyny and bullying within the college community, the report reads, no one seemed willing to take him on, but you did. I say this to each of the men who shared their truth with Ms. Rubin, and also to all the people who agreed to be interviewed by her and her colleagues. You are giving Kings the opportunity to do now what it should have done in 1991 when the first formal complaint was made. It is a mark of shame that it took your resolve to usher in the deep reflection and conscious culture change we are now called upon as a community to collectively undertake and to sustain. We will do this by continuing to follow the guidance of the interim report and by following Ms. Rubin's fourth recommendation, which is to entrench what we must learn from this process into our institutional memory and our ongoing work to ensure proper boundaries between professors and students are maintained and by following her fifth recommendation, which is that we create processes to ensure there is deep reflection about what has occurred and the lessons we must draw from it for the future. Further and on a personal note, when Dr. Hankey retired, I stood by and allowed a huge painting of him, of his commissioning, to be hung in our library, overlooking the reading room where students study without asking the questions about the past or the appropriateness of this honor that I should have asked, uh, that I should have asked. With hindsight, I clearly see the harm that caused. And I personally apologize for this and for hesitating for far too long in having that portrait removed. The university cannot undo the harm that was done or the failure to respond appropriately to that harm. I hope, however, that this independent review and the university's response to the final report will at least provide some me measure of consolation and hope, as well as confidence in how King's will conduct itself in the future. To all our past students, as well as our faculty and staff who experienced the bullying and misogyny Ms. Rubin describes in her report, and to everyone who had their educational experience or their experience as faculty or staff impaired by these aspect of, aspects of Wayne Hankey's beha behavior, we apologize to you, too for not making your safety, your well-being, and your equal participation in the life of Kings our top priority. We did not live up to the values of community, togetherness, and belonging that we profess to be our core values. We also did not live up to the responsibilities and obligations we have as a place of higher learning to students and parents who put their trust in us. We are sorry. That sorrow goes beyond and deeper than my words can convey. My personal conviction is that forgiveness depends on acceptance of responsibility and atonement in institutions as well as with individuals. While accepting that Kings may never be forgiven by some for its responsibility and accountability relating to the sexual violence, bullying, and misogyny of Dr. Hankey, my hope is that through the Rubin Report and our response to it, Kings can show it is worthy of forgiveness for those who are able and willing to forgive with my King's colleagues, with the whole King's community, 
I am determined to ensure that King's uses all that it has learned from this process to become a university that does everything it can to prevent sexual violence in its community and to respond to it when it happens with the seriousness that violence always requires. Now I would like to demonstrate our willingness to begin to tackle the conversations ahead by opening the floor for questions. As a university that teaches journalists, we respect deadlines. So I'll start with questions from the media, including those from any student journalists who are here, before opening it up to whomever, whomever else in Alumni Hall have questions. If you are online, you can send us your questions by emailing Adrian Abbott. That's Adrian Abbott at Adrian with one N, dot Abbott with two T's, at ukings.ca. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kate McKenna with CBC News. I just wanted to ask you about the settlements. Uh, will settlements be given to all 13 victims, and do you have any idea what the budgeted amount of money for that will be? Um, we're going forward on the basis of responding to the individuals who come forward to us with uh, claims. Um, and uh, we're following Ms. Rubin's um, guidance in that we're opening to, open to doing the right thing for everyone who comes forward. Um, we're very hopeful that one of the uh, benefits of this report is that it can allow, allow the discussion of doing uh, justice by people to go forward on the basis of acceptance that these harms were experienced, that these things happened, and that we can focus on what is the appropriate compensation uh, for those harms. I, Mm. Um, we're not making predeterminations about eligibility. Um, we're taking each matter uh, that comes forward as it comes forward. Um, and we're going to be responding guided by the findings of Ms. Uh, Rubin. I'll just emphasize that our goal is appropriate and just compensation. And so when people have been harmed in ways that warrant compensation, we are interested in paying them compensation. As to the dollar amount, um, that can't be determined in advance because in a system that's focused on achieving appropriate and just compensation, that's the process that will determine how much compensation is warranted. Yes, right here. Um, any litigation that has been launched that the King's not contested yeah. to avoid further harm to those yeah. who launched the lawsuits. Yeah. Um, what is your position on that? That's our determination to achieve that outcome. We are following the Rubin report in every particular. Uh, so that's the basis on which we're going to go forward. We also do not believe that these kinds of matters should be litigated. Okay. Uh, Jesse with CT. Hi, it's Lindsay Armstrong with the Canadian Press. Uh, in regards to the numerous occasions where Hankey's actions were made known to the school and the school did not act or actively protected Hankey, is the university looking at tracking down the individuals um, who would have been responsible at the time for protecting his job? Um, um, I think Ms. Rubin quite deliberately focused on the institution's responsibilities and accountabilities. Um, she made the deliberate choice uh, not to be naming anyone in her report. And I think she did that, and this is just my interpretation, because she's focused on the uh, responsibilities for the institution. And I believe that's consistent with um, making progress in the forward, in, in the future, that we understand that this was a collective failure, that there are, are many people who could have said something, could have done something, 
and that it might be a mistake and perhaps even counterproductive for this community to focus on what are the particular individuals who are blameworthy in this or that respect. Uh, that's, what the, that's the message that comes out of the report to me and that's the, um, the message and the approach that we're going to follow. Uh, Jesse Thomas with CTV News. Yeah, and then over here, right here next. Thank you. Uh, just wanted a clarification on when you received the final report. And um... Um, So the f final, final report arrived yesterday. Uh, before that time, I was um, allowed to see uh, draft versions of it for the purpose of being in a position to speak to the men who had spoken to Janice Rubin with knowledge of her findings in respect of them. Um, but the final report was just finalized yesterday. Okay, thank you for that. And given that we've just seen the report, you say all recommendations will be, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, but honored. Is there a timeline for that? Um, well, um, in their nature, so one of them had a very short timeline, apologize. And we're doing that on schedule. Um, the other recommendations in their nature are recommendations that we will be living with for years and decades to come because they're about cultural change. As I said in my remarks, although I believe firmly that as a community we're making progress, cultural change takes a lot of time, a lot of sustained work, and we're going to continue uh, to keep Ms. Rubin's uh, recommendations in mind. One of them very specifically was about institutionalizing the memory of all this uh, in King's life in the community of, of King so it cannot be forgotten. And um, that's, that's one that um, we'll, we'll make sure that these lessons and this experience is um, with us for the duration uh, of the college's uh, life. With the recommendation of compensation, will it be the university itself that uh determines the award, or will it seek outside guidance, like perhaps Ms. Rubin or, or the courts to determine that payout? Um, so this is um, not something the university can decide on its own. There's a conversation going on between claimants and sometimes the solicitors for claimants and uh, the solicitors for insurance companies, because there are insurance companies involved, and the uh, solicitors for the university. If it is helpful to achieving just and appropriate compensation, the university would be very open to um, asking for the assistance of a third party. For example, a mediator is often uh, used in these kinds of situations. Over here. Thanks. Um, Martin Bauman with The Coast. Uh, a brief question and a follow-up. Uh, King's College has mentioned its commitment to a, a safe and welcoming learning environment in light of these findings um, that, you know, that a, that a predator was in its midst. What message, if any, do you have to students, current, future, about um, how to you know, reconcile the two and, and create that safe environment? Yeah. Um, I understand the skepticism behind the, uh, the question, and there's no simple or easy answer to that. Um, and uh, this is certainly not the day for saying this is history and what we're doing now is different and look at all the great things that we're doing. But the reality is ever since 2018, we have been doing a lot of work, um, um, a new policy, um, um, expertise that we didn't have in the past with a sexual health and safety officer. Um, there's a lot of progress being made in including the whole community in the work that we need to do. Bottom line for me is it's not words that are going to make the difference, it's actions and those actions have to take place over, uh, over time for people to regain uh, the confidence and trust that uh, we would like them to be able to have in our university and community. Brief follow-up. Uh, is the university aware of any non-disclosure agreements that Hankey signed with any of his uh, accusers or victims? Um, you know, sometimes my ability to know everything that the university knows is limited. But um, 
I'm, I'm fairly well versed in all of this given the process we've been through and based on the information that I have, the answer is an unequivocal no. Alicia Drost with Global News. Uh, you had mentioned that you are asking any other potential victims to come forward within the month. I'm just wondering why set a timeline or a deadline for that? What if, you know, individuals yeah. need more time? Um, we're following Janice Rubin's advice in all respects, and the report itself says provide a 30-day uh, opportunity. Um, I should be careful about speculating about what's in Janice Rubin's mind uh, when she wrote that recommendation, but that's the recommendation we wrote and that's the one we're going to follow. Olivia Piercy, The Signal. Um, one of the recommendations is to ensure appropriate relationships and behavior between students and teachers. What steps will be taken to satisfy yeah. that recommendation? So that was one of the key recommendations of the interim report as well that there be um, either a code of conduct or a statement of principles uh, that is uh, developed through conversation uh, with faculty. Um, and the thought behind doing that is it's one thing to have a rule that people have to comply with. It's not quite another thing to have people go through the process in uh, figuring out what the rule should be. So that work has been going forward ever since we got the interim report last May. Uh, Vice President Sarah Clift has been leading that work with uh, program directors and other members of faculty. And um, our, we're, we're confident that at the June meeting of the board, there's going to be a statement of principles put in front of the board for approval on that point. Uh, meanwhile, the consciousness level at King's about the need to be conscious of the appropriate boundaries in interacting with students has been raised significantly both by the interim report and I believe by this final report as well. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, Francis Campbell with the Chronicle Herald. So can you or can the university provide any explanation as to why the complaints were not acted upon or addressed at the time they came to light? Yeah. So I don't have any independent source of information uh, about what happened or might have happened. I believe the conclusion that Ms. Rubin uh, came to uh, in respect of the 1990-91 matter is that the committee that was looking at it, uh, or considering it, asked to consider it, um, had a misunderstanding of what they were dealing with and um, didn't do the kind of probing questions that the, um, that the ecclesiastical court, which was considering the matter at, in virtually the same time, that they actually conducted. And so the language of the report is that the committee accepted uh, Dr. Hankey's version of the behavior, which it, was that it was an improper but consensual relationship with a student. As the final report says, the complaint mentioned the word sexual assault ten times. And the committee did not ask uh, to speak to the complainant. And so it proceeded seriously because an improper relationship with students is a serious matter, but with a fundamental misunderstanding of what the complaint complainant had alleged and what the behavior in question uh, was. At uh, what level of, uh, at the university, was this uh, were the people on this committee, who, who were they basically? So this is all in the report. It is a committee created by the president of the time. It consisted of three members of faculty, uh, and they did their work over a number of months in, I believe, uh, the early part of 1991. Do you think uh, there was the p potential there for uh, the committee to not make it public uh, just to protect the university's reputation? Um, 
that may well have been the motivation of the time. Um, um, I, I, can't, I can't speak to that. I, I'm not arguing against that interpretation. I do think I want to say that um, um, my reading of the report is that the committee was perhaps like much of the, other, the rest of the university at the time in that they, the university as a, as a whole was in a kind of denial of the behavior that Dr. Hankey was um, engaged in because as the report points out, even before uh, the complaint of 1990-91, there were incidents that called for more in-depth inquiry uh, than was given to them uh, by the university. In contrast, the ecclesiastical court in 1991, it not only looked into the complaint in more detail, but it went back and did its own investigation of some of these other incidents that had happened at the university in order to have a fuller picture of the matter that was immediately before them. Even if this was a misunderstanding on the part of, of many people, there are some things in the report that signal that there was a sort of cover up at times it, uh, over the decades. We think of, for instance, the lifeguard sheet that got ripped out mm -hmm. of that notebook. And I'm just wondering, what do you have to say personally to the people at King's who knew that something inappropriate, possibly criminal, was happening and didn't act? I apologize to them as well. I, I, in, in particular, there's a campus police officer. I think that's clear from uh, the report of Janice Rubin, who tried to do the right thing. and. Um, it didn't generate the support from the university that was called for at the time. Um, um, again, th um, I don't want this to become me trying to convince any of you that this is all just history and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, but transparency and honesty and um, realism about uh, what's happening in the community is um, vitally important in terms of protecting people and making sure that something like this never happens again. Sorry, I think I maybe misasked my question. What would you say to the people who did not act but knew? Well, I think they should have done better. Um, I, I don't have any alternative but to say that because that's the conclusion of the report. But I, but I emphasize again that the report emphasizes that um, um, there's a, it was a collective kind of systemic failure in, uh, in addressing um, either the behavior of Dr. Hankey or the evidence or indications that were available that some inquiry should have been made relative to the behavior of Dr. Hankey. Any other media questions? Yes. Yeah, Dr. Hankey was a larger than life personality. Um, mm -hmm. He obviously left a big imprint on this community, on this university. How do you guard against somebody like that who had the ability to throw his yeah. weight around, probably had an impact on cowing people who might have come forward with complaints? Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to change processes for the general public or rank and file members of the faculty. Yeah. You've got somebody like that. Yeah. What assurances can you offer that Basically, it's, a demagogue doesn't get yeah. rise again. Don't put people on a pedestal. And um, don't create heroes out of mere human beings. Um, this community has unique academic programs that I think are very, very important. Um, but sometimes it can lead to us being a little self-referential, a little um, insular about the broader world. And uh, sometimes people are celebrated um, with um, out, uh, considering of the broader world of ideas and context. Um, so I, I, those are some of the lessons that I take from it. Um, but when you put someone on a pedestal and uh, you give them a certain kind of status, uh, founder of the foundation, your program, builder of the library, so on and so forth, you're doing, whether it's intentional or not, you're, you're contributing to that feeling of impunity uh, that the report references. And that's, I believe, very, very uh, dangerous and per perhaps particularly dangerous in a smaller community like King's. 
And uh, to go back to the previous question, uh, doesn't matter who does behavior that should be called into question and called to task, people, it needs to be called into question and people need to be taken to task. So, for example, a lot of this misogyny and bullying, it happened in plain view. It happened at faculty meetings. It happened at committee meetings. It, it happened in, uh, in the dining hall. And uh, just all of us, when we see behavior like that, we, um, and it's not always easy. I know that's the premise of your question. Uh, but you make a real important contribution to everyone's health and well-being when you call misbehavior to account. Okay, is there any, yes, anyone else? Jenna, that's a student journalist. <laughs> Jenna Olson, Dalhousie Gazette. Why wasn't Dr. Henke's position at King's more heavily reconsidered following his guilty verdict in front of an ecclesiastical court? Well, so the, the, just factually what happened is people didn't know the outcome of the ecclesiastical court. They knew that his license had been revoked, but they didn't know the basis on which the court had reached that decision. And the basis on which the court reached that decision is that he had sexually assaulted uh, a young person who was a King's student multiple times. And so um, that goes to what Janice Rubin says about the work of our committee. They didn't have access to the ruling of the ecclesiastical court. In sequence, I don't even know if they knew the sentence by then, but they certainly didn't know the basis on which the court had acted. But Rubin's conclusion is they, just from the face of the complaint, the document, they should have done more probing analysis of the complaint rather than accepting Dr. Hankey's characterization of it, which is that he was responsible for having an inappropriate consensual relationship. It wasn't a consensual relationship. Who at King's at the time would have made the decision to not go forward with that investigation? Uh, so the president of the day uh, created a committee uh, to look into the complaint. And uh, the committee conducted its inquiry, as Janice Rubin says, taking their task seriously, but at the same time not really understanding uh, what they were potentially dealing with and therefore not going beyond Dr. Hankey's own characterization of his behavior. So that's where the decision was made. Hello. I am not a journalist. Um, <laughs> Uh, as a student at King's, I, I, I want to um, reiterate uh, the gratitude that you shared for um, the subject's uh, bravery and, and commitment to justice. I, I am also grateful for um, Janice Rubin's guidance um, on, on language at the beginning of the report, which uh, indicates that uh, folks who came forward will be referred to as subjects um, according to uh, their comfort level, um, and I, I'm, 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 I'm really grateful to have that guidance. Um, I also really want to express my gratitude to students who have made an effort to keep me safe and keep my community safe. Um, uh, through the report, uh, it's, it's clear that complaints and allegations were not given um, appropriate attention and weight, um, but, and I'm, I also uh, am grateful for, for, for your framing as as institutional responsibility over individual responsibility, um, because I, I do agree that it is a collective failure that everyone failed, and then and that pointing um, towards specific actions or failures uh, uh, removes responsibility from others who could have done things. Um, my my question is is uh, Hanky cited as uh, the creator or founder of FIP, um, and what has been done or will be done specifically to protect FIP students. 
um, now and in the future. Uh, this is a question both about curriculum and uh, the culture of FIP, mm -hmm. where we, you know, valorize um, uh, our, our incredibly intelligent um, and uh, professors, professors and tutors, but um, that can that can allow uh, folks to have a dismissive attitude towards students, um, both intellectually and then. Uh, that permeates into like in, on an individual level, and I'm wondering specifically what will be done in FIP. Yeah. Sorry, that was long. Yep. So thank you for that question. Um, so um, at a general level, uh, you heard what I said earlier about the conversations that are going on about appropriate boundaries, and how that's going to be crystallized into a document, which would be a part of the responsibilities of everyone who teaches at King's. Um, I, I think your point about um, valorizing uh, individuals, I, I mean, I'm in favor of celebrating excellence in teaching. I think we have excellent teachers at King's in the foundation year program and elsewhere. Uh, but I, I do agree with you that it can become a danger um, if it's, it doesn't have a context and if we're not suitably humble, actually, uh, about who we are uh, and uh, what we have or have not accomplished. Uh, so I uh, identify with the premise of your question. Um, I also think I have some sympathy for what you're saying about uh, the way in which change is not just about uh, policies and procedures relative to sexualized violence, but it's the whole culture that can create a context and a circumstances where the risk of that is greater than it might otherwise uh, be. And um, as you may know, we're doing an awful lot of work at King's around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And uh, sexualized violence is the, maybe the ultimate in exclusion uh, from the community. Um, so I, I welcome your uh, point of view, and I think we need to keep it in mind as we proceed uh, around becoming a more inclusive community in all respects. And um, uh, what we teach and how we teach it is a vitally important part of that. I'll just mention that the faculty is working on a, a new academic plan for the university, it has a major focus on equity, diversity, inclusion, reconciliation, and uh, I'm hoping that will be an opportunity for um, rejuvenating the curriculum throughout the college in a way that makes learning uh, at King's as well as teaching at, Kling, at King's, a more inclusive endeavor. Hi there, uh, I'm Rowan, I'm a current FIP student. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, King's and specifically the Foundation Year program are both institutions where putting our professors or our tutors on a quote-unquote pedestal is very easy to slip into, um, but that is more, I would agree, due to the nature of the program and how it works, and I um, am hesitant to chalk that up as putting people on a pedestal and rather um, kind of putting respect towards our professors mm. in a way where we assume that that will keep us safe. And I just would like to, my question I guess is that um, our current professors our t or um, tutors and staff members at King's in general, are they um, being put through any sort of pre uh, preventative sexual assault or sexualized violence training or education at the moment? And if not, will this be no. a formal process that they will all need yeah. to go through? Thank you for the question, and uh, the distinction between, I, I think this is what I'm hearing, putting people on a pedestal and respecting them, I think is a very, very important uh, distinction, and I accept that. So, um, before the interim report, uh, we were putting a lot more emphasis on training and supporting everyone in the King's community, including faculty members, uh, about creating uh, safer learning environments. And uh, since the interim report, uh, which puts a real focus on that, for example, making sure uh, that training on our sexual awareness, response, and prevention policies are part of our orientation, stronger part of orientation for students, 
uh, a part of our orientation for new faculty and staff. So that's happening. I'll just say on the question of mandatory training, uh, which uh, Janice Rubin said, either mandatory or with incentives, um, that's an example of one of those topics around which I think people of good faith who want us to do better can have important disagreements. I won't speak for Jordan Roberts, who's sitting right there. She will speak for herself. But we've had good conversations about uh, how mandatory can actually be counterproductive if uh, people feel that they're not being given opportunity to learn, but they're actually going through a process of indoctrination. Um, I'm not saying that for the purpose of saying we're not doing mandatory training. I'm saying that there are some true complexities about how to move forward to achieve the desired outcome, which is training for everybody and support for everyone so we can have more awareness of how our behavior may be inadvertently uh, creating risk and difficulty and, and uh, training about how to do better. Uh, in respect of uh, inclusion and making sure people are safe and feel safe in our learning spaces and every other part of the college. Hi there. I was just curious, um, adding on to that question, if that um, sensitivity training would apply to um, Campus Patrol or any other um, DAWN or resident staff alike? Yes, all our DAWNs go through that training. And by the mean, what I mean by that training is the training that we now provide. I'm sure it will change and evolve as we learn more about how to do it well and as the world learns more about how this training can be most effective. Uh, but that it is universal in that context. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Carlo Cianini. I'm with The Signal. Um, and despite the... Oh, there you are. Uh, sorry. Uh, despite the investigation that happened in 1991 by the church, the report uh, insinuates that there is still a lot known by staff and by especially the student body, um, kind of pointing out that this might have been pushed under the rug. So considering this kind of open secret that might have existed in the university at the time, why did it take so long for anybody to pursue an investigation up until Hankey's end as a professor in 2015. Yeah. Um, well, all I can say is it shouldn't have. I fully accept that criticism of the university uh, that, uh, that is in the, in the report. And we must make sure that we never make that kind of mistake again. Uh, we have mechanisms in place now that we did not have then. One of the best things about them is people don't have to rely on me or any other administrator, uh, although that's not to uh, say that we don't have responsibilities, because we certainly do, but there's a process now that is in the hands of uh, our sexual health and safety officer uh, where uh, it's all laid out in advance. Uh, the rights and obligations of everyone involved in the process are set out, and investigations, if there are going to be investigations, they happen very independent of me. Um, uh, I have to stay separate and apart from them because there can be situations where I'm the ultimate decision maker or a recommendation uh, will come to me. So I fully accept the criticism of the past. I recognize its continuing relevance to what we do now. We should never pat ourselves on the back and say, this could never happen again. We're, we've done everything that we need to do. But I, at the same time, I feel it's appropriate to recognize the progress that we're making. All right, thank you. Um, so this is more of a question from somebody who's a current FIP student. So I would like to know a little bit more about what exactly is going to be done to change the training of the patrol and security because I, like from my own personal experiences, I know of patrol walking in into situations that they are very much needed mm -hmm. and are very serious life-threatening situations and then not knowing how to properly deal with them. Yeah. Um, and this, is, ha, ha, this has, even throughout just this year, been a repeated occurrence, mm -hmm. so I want to know how that training is going to change. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, and um, um, 
Katie Merwin is sitting right there, and I will ask Katie to talk to you immediately after uh, this event uh, to provide you with an answer to that uh, question. Uh, I'm interested in what you said. I take what you said at face value, and if that's the case, then we need to do something about it. Um, hello, um, my name is Natalia. I'm here representing the King Student Union. And again, you s we're ta having a lot of really important conversations about the importance of involving the larger community. Of course, um, Don staff is essential to the King's campus. They really make it what it is. So many students are far from home and Don, Don's are in fact um, an essential like experience to their time at King's. However, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about staff, and by that mm -hmm. I mean professors, mm -hmm. um, teaching assistants, because again, this continues involve, involving right. the larger King's community, yeah. which is again, um, such a big goal, and like you say, yeah. instilling a culture of change uh, yeah. through time. So, in addition to everything I've already said about the work that's being done, um, what I'm encouraged by, and it's been happening today and it's been happening for a while, is the positive comments I get from faculty about the fact that this is happening, okay? And um, the, the growing uh, momentum, I think, is happening within all parts of our community. Said earlier, uh, students, and it's definitely the case among students, and I always try to acknowledge how much my, what I've done takes its lead uh, from our students in these respects. And I'm deeply thankful and grateful uh, for our students for their leadership on these issues. Um, but, I, but I think there's a, a growing um, um, positivity among our faculty to do this work and to learn how to do it better. And, um, and we have to remember that in light of the history that uh, that Ruben has brought to our attention, some of the people who suffered are members of faculty and staff, right? So I think there's a, a general feeling that there's a moment of opportunity here in terms of moving forward, addressing things that should have been addressed long ago, and making the community better for everybody. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you have um, any statements on policy or plans of action to help decrease the statistics of uh, sexual violence on campus between students. Yeah. Um, everything we're doing is about that. Uh, that. I think that's the best answer I can give. Again, uh, Jordan uh, can provide more detailed information, but um, it's a, we have a, comp a comprehensive plan of action. And uh, you know, one of the um, values in your question is we quite rightly, in the context of this report, are focused on uh, uh, professor-student relationships, but the risk of sexualized violence uh, involves other kinds of relationships as well. Uh, and so literally everything we're doing is about that. Uh, we have a sexualized violence policy advisory committee uh, and we certainly welcome all suggestions and input uh, into that process about what further action we can do and how we can do better. As it stands now, is there anything within the policy that would justify action um, in like case-by-case -case situations of sexual violence between students? Because I know that there are a lot of issues um, where cases will lack backing by like judicial systems and then the university can't put anything in place to protect students. I'm not, so did you, uh, did you just, I didn't quite hear, can't move forward in the judicial system? Um, I'm talking about if a student brought um, any accounts forward, um, yeah. but weren't bringing it forward to a, like a, a judicial level, um, yeah. a court case, yeah. would there be a situation where the school could take action in other ways to keep these students safe? Yes. Yeah, our policy defines sexualized violence broadly and inclusively. And um, uh, you know anyone can make a report, uh, make a disclosure, 
And we have an obligation when we have a report or a disclosure to act on them. And sometimes that involves an investigation and investigations sometimes reach one conclusion or another conclusion. But the policy is a, a broad one. Um, and it has nothing to do whether or not it would give a cause of action in the judicial process. there. Hi. Um, uh, my question is on kind of the same similar one that lots of students have been talking about today. Um, but have you considered at all that it may be seen as hypocritical that sexual violence and anti-oppression workshops are mandatory for student staff, DONS, patrol, yep. desk staff, etc., yep. but not for faculty and staff on campus? Yep. Do you understand your response earlier, given your consultations yep. with Jordan yep. around the fears of indoctrination? Yep. However, it feels that the burden and the work of keeping right. students safe on campus and protected yep. is once again falling entirely onto the shoulders yep. of student staff. I respect your view that it's falling entirely on the shoulders of students and staff. I don't believe that's the case. I think there's lots of work going on at lots of different levels. I do respect your point about the, your employer making it mandatory for you and uh, it not being mandatory for other people in the community, and we'll t take that into account. I think that's an excellent point. Um, th there can be variations and levels of responsibility uh, that can make for different outcomes for different classes of employees, but I think your point is a very um, important one. Okay, okay, there's one more. Okay. Just had one yes, um, on. follow-up really quickly. You mentioned uh, that in, when new staff were hired, specifically patrol or, or DAWN staff, they would be going through this training. Um, I, as a student, would just like to, um, I understand that training will be happening, um, but that it may not be mandatory, and I understand the um, difficulties within that system for sure, however, I feel um, that as students, a lot of us would feel uh, safer, I would say, if the um, kind of more established or older quote unquote professors and staff who have been here for longer and who may have been a part of the King's community during the time that all of this um, was going on, especially given the fact that um, people who did not come forward will be remaining anonymous, which I respect, but I feel that there is kind of a duty there um, within the university for all staff, um, yeah. specifically professors and tutors, to undergo said training. So let me say more clearly than I have, in my opinion, everyone who works at the university should have this training. I, I agree with you entirely on that uh, point, okay? Um, and we're doing everything we can to make sure all students have it as well. Uh, we did a lot more work last August and in September uh, to make sure that um, as many students at, as possible received this training right at the beginning of their experience at King's as a way of articulating our expectations of what a member, what, what being a member in this community means. But I agree with you, everyone who's part of our community should have this training. I've had this training. Okay, thank you very much. As uh, usual, when a gathering happens at King's, the King's students have lots of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone on live stream for joining us.